Good evening and welcome to our program. This series is focusing on This Is Your FBI. This Is Your FBI was a radio crime drama which aired in the United States on ABC from April 6, 1945 to January 30th, 1953 for a total of 409 shows. The show featured true cases from the FBI and was told from an FBI agent's viewpoint. FBI Chief J. Edgar Hoover gave it his endorsement, calling it our show and calling it the finest dramatic program on the air. Generally, I do not include advisories. Given Hoover's polarizing nature, I will share this. Dramatized stories created for propaganda purposes are not history. They tell one biased side of the story, and in no way am I saying that these are reliable stories. I just believe them to be interesting when viewed through the scope of entertainment and weird history. Finally, I'd like to send a specific thank you to publicdomainreview.org and archive.org for organizing and compiling all of this media. If you would like to listen to standalone media, we have included a link in the description. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Before enacting tonight's timely case, I'd like to call your attention to a very significant fact about the sponsor of tonight's program, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And that's the increasing number of women who are becoming members of the Equitable Society. More and more, women are seeking security through life insurance. They call on Equitable Society representatives eager to know of the many uses and applications of modern life insurance. In fact, a number of our Equitable Society representatives are themselves women. I'll tell you about one of them later. Just like the men, they realize the value of life insurance both to the individual policyholder and to the community. They know that by serving Equitable Society members, they serve America. Tonight's FBI file, The Bogus War Bride. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI presents another in the series of demonstrations of gratitude for the heroic sacrifices of the returned veteran being performed daily by that lower rung member of America's criminal society. He who was first in lying, first in cheating, and first in the pockets of his countrymen, the swindler. <laughs> In a certain bar off Times Square, which became a favorite oasis of G.I.s during the war, two of the last three vacant stools have been quickly spotted by the deliriously happy couple just coming in the door. Well, here we are, baby. Bartender, give us a couple of champagne cocktails. Okay. We got a lot of celebrating to do tonight, huh, Betty? Rather. Oh, listen to that. Rather what? Rather be here than any sport on earth, that's what. <laughs> oh, you yeah. kill me with those quick comebacks, oh. baby. You know, that's what got me into this mess to start with. Now, just what do you mean by that, George? That night in Piccadilly when I asked you to marry me, you came back with yes so quick I didn't have a chance to change me blooming mind. Well, <laughs> if that's the way you feel about it, I'll get right back on the boat and go home. Would you really, baby? I say, what a jolly big lawyer I am, what? <laughs> <laughs> Here's your drink, mister. Oh, thanks. Here, baby. Go. Here's to the Queen Mary for bringing me Princess Betty. Here's to you, love. Congratulations, chum. Huh? Uh, congratulations. Oh, thanks, pal. My bride's still stuck over there. Uh huh? May take another six months. Oh, sir, what a pity. Yeah, it's tough. Anyway, let me join in drinking to your reunion. Thanks, it's awfully nice of you. Yeah. Well, here's to you. 
Here's hoping you and your missus beat that six-month rap. Rather. You know, confidentially, pal, my wife here would still be stuck over there, too, if I hadn't run onto a way to do a little finagling. Sure. What's the matter? You want us to get arrested on our first night? What do you mean, get arrested? We're talking about how we worked it, that's why. Oh, look, baby, the soldier here is one of us. Well, you can't tell who else might be listening. Well, there's no police in here. Just because you don't see any brass buttons, there's no sign. Okay, okay. Look, uh, I don't know how you worked it to get your wife over, but I'd sure like to know. Well... I guess you can tell from the way Betty's putting the clamps on me that it's kind of a down-under proposition, if you know what I mean. Anything that will get my wife over here is all right with me. After all, she's, she's got a right to be here, hasn't she? Come on. Let's all move over to that empty booth in the corner. Okay. Come on, baby. Right oh. Excuse me, mister. Slide in, sugar. Charlie. Now, look, pal. Yeah? Maybe I better tell you first how much this deal cost me. How much? 500 smackers. 500? Can't you raise it? I guess I can. Now well, these guys work fast. Well, I'll have the dough tomorrow. That fast enough? Yeah, I guess so. Okay. What's the proposition? Was it all right with you if I tell him, Betty? After all, I gotta help a buddy, you know. Go ahead. Okay. If you can raise 500 bucks tomorrow, you can get your wife over here in two or three weeks just like I did. Really? Sure. And here's how it works. In the local field office of the FBI, Assistant Agent in Charge Everett has just summoned Special Agent Grafton to his office. You sent for me, Mr. Everett? Yes, Grafton. I uh, just got a special teletype from Director Hoover. A swindle case he wants us to go to work on right away. Yes, sir. It's a fake passport racket being worked against returned veterans whose foreign brides are still over there. Oh? Due to the tremendous backlog of applications for passports and other necessary papers, it may be several months before some of the wives can get over here. I know. So the racketeer spots a veteran whose wife is way down the list and sells him a fake American passport to send to his wife. Mm-hmm. Have we got any lead? Two of these fake passports were picked up in London yesterday when two brides presented them for inspection. I see. They're being rushed to us by airmail. But in the meantime, here are the names and addresses of the two husbands here in the city. Aren't they liable to arrest on a conspiracy charge? Technically, yes. But Mr. Hoover has no desire to arrest a veteran for trying to get his wife over here. All we want is their cooperation in exposing the swindlers. Well, then I better try to contact them right away. One of them lives out in Jackson Heights. The other one up near Columbia University. Here are the addresses. Okay. And see if you can get a good description of who sold them the passports and how and where they were contacted. Right. You got that passport for the sucker nearly ready, baby? Just about, George, old thing. Oh, look, can that accent, will you, when we're not working on somebody? Okay, sugar. But if I slip out of character in the middle of a deal sometime... Well, it just might be rather embarrassing for us, don't you know? <laughs> you and your British understatement. Look, George, you better get some more of this kind of paper from the station or we're about out. Never mind. We'll get some more when we get to the West Coast. Yeah, but we only got enough left for... What did you say? I said we'll get some more paper on the West Coast. What do you mean, West Coast? That's where we're going. How come? Look, baby, we've been sprinkling these phony passports around here like confetti. And making lots of nice dough, too. I know. And the way to keep the dough is to change scenery before we get caught. What makes you think we're Think gonna... nothing. We're hotter than a couple of tamales right now. So? So, two more suckers after tonight, and we head for Frisco. Why Frisco? Because, my pet, there is a very sad situation out there, too. Huh? Yep. There's a lot of poor GIs out there with wives way out in Australia. Oh, of course, of course. And I must do something for me blooming sisters down under. What? Can I come in, Mr. Everett? Oh, come ahead, Grafton. Uh, did you locate the husbands? I talked to one of them. The other's out of town. What'd you find out? Well, I got a pretty good description of the swindlers. Good. How many are there? A man and a woman. 
Oh? Yes, he's around 35, she's younger, and speaks with a British accent. Uh Uh-huh. They uh, play the midtown bars frequented by servicemen and put on a big act about how happy they are to be reunited. She plays the part of his British bride who's just arrived. I see. And some serviceman whose wife is still overseas butts in and asks how they managed it. And there's another victim ready to be taken. Cost this chap $500. Well, obviously the swindler didn't produce a phony passport on the spot. At their first meeting, I mean. No, the victim raised the money and they met again next day to complete the deal. But he had no idea of where to contact the swindler in the meantime. That's right. First contact was at a bar and the second meeting took place at the victim's house. All right. Phone the descriptions of the swindlers to the police department and see if they check with anybody they have a record on. Right. And I'll get every available agent we have and get them started covering all midtown bars at once. Hello? Hiya, pal. This is George. Oh, hello there. Everything set? I talked to the guys and they didn't want to do business. What? They wanted to lay off for a while. Afraid they might be getting hot. Yeah, yeah, but look, I I already raised the 500 bucks. They can't back out on me. I gotta get my wife over here. Okay, okay, you're gonna get her here. Yeah, but you just said... Keep your shirt on, will you? You're in. I don't get it. Look, I'm not letting a buddy down. I talked the guys into making a deal for you. Yeah? They're just scared to deliver any more in person, the new customers, you see? Oh. So I promised I'd deliver yours for them and collect the dough for them. Then you've got it. Sure. You got the 500 with you? Yeah. Where, where'll I meet you? At that same bar? No, no. We better make it somewhere more private. I don't want to get caught either, you know. I'd have a tough time proving I'm not mixed up in this business. Sure, I know. I'll meet you wherever you say. Okay. How about your place? Swell. 36 Cherry Lane. It's down in the village. Basement apartment. Okay. Be there in 20 minutes. <laughs> Nobody like that in your files, huh, Sergeant? Okay, well, thanks a lot anyway. Police headquarters hasn't got anything on them, Grafton? No. Then I'll teletype the descriptions to Washington to see if identification has got anything that checks. Okay. You better hop out and cover a few midtown bars yourself for a while. Right. Uh, Take the area between Broadway and 8th Avenue from 46th to 49th. I've got the rest covered. Want me to call in in case something breaks? Yeah. And I hope there's a break before another victim loses $500, too. Just a minute. Oh, hello, George. Come on in. Okay. Look, I I can't stay long. Guys gave me an hour to get back with the dough, and besides, Betty don't know I'm doing this, or she'd be scared to death. I was afraid you might change your mind yourself on the way down here. Ah, you know, I never let a buddy down. I know. Okay. Where's the dough? Where's the passport? I got it right here. Well, let's see it. What's the matter? You think it's a gag? I just want to see what I'm getting for my money, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, okay. Hey, yeah. Thanks. And I'm telling you, pal, it's a perfect imitation, too. Uh-huh. All the information you gave me on your wife is fixed up in there right. All you got to do is paste a picture on there and you're all set. Yeah. All set to get my wife and me in a jam, maybe, and lose 500 bucks besides. What? She'd have as much chance of getting through on this as she would on a hat check. What are you talking about? My wife came through on one and I... Cut out the lion, mister. I got wise to your racket this morning. You rooked a pal of mine on the same deal. Look, buddy, you got me wrong. I'm not mixed up in any racket. I said cut out lion. But I'm telling you that... I went through with this just to get you down here. And the reason I haven't got a couple of cops waiting for you is because I wanted to do a little work on you myself first. Now, what do you mean? I mean like... (laughs) Stand up, you dirty chiseler, and take another one. Stand up! Here we are, soldier. Put that gun away. Not when it's about to go off. Sucker. Some of the most important people in the American business world are women. 
While waiting for tonight's FBI file to reopen, let me tell you about one who works for our sponsor, the Equitable Life Assurance Society. This week at the Equitable Society, I met one of America's outstanding businesswomen. She's a leading life insurance saleswoman. I asked her just how she happened to be in the life insurance business. Well, she said, when my husband and I were just starting out in life, we had very little money, but we had great plans. And we had a brand new life insurance policy in the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. One month later, my husband died. Well, the money from his Equitable Society policy didn't lessen my grief and shock, but it did help me through some mighty difficult times. And one day I thought to myself, why, I can sell this. I can show people the importance of life insurance because I know from personal experience. So I got a position with the Equitable Society and now I spend my life in this satisfactory business of building security. Well, having talked with her, I understand why 30% of all Equitable Life Assurance Society policies are currently being bought by women. Professional women, business women, women whose career is a home. Women everywhere are seeking the protection and security that comes with a policy in the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Yes, women too know that this week and every week for more than 86 years, the Equitable Life Assurance Society has been building security for you, your home, and your country. And now back to the FBI file, the bo bogus war bride. <laughs> There is a principle of human justice embodied in the codes of law wherever human rights are respected. A principle often referred to as mitigating circumstances. In the Victor Hugo classic Les Miserables, Jean Valjean was guilty of a robbery, but he stole in order to feed his starving family. That was the mitigating circumstance which lessened his guilt in the eyes of the just. Such a defense might be offered to lessen the guilt of the G.I. who was a victim of impersonation and conspired in the forgery of a passport. He was about to do it with the honorable intention of reuniting his family. In the office of the FBI, Assistant Agent in Charge Everett is just finishing a telephone conversation as Special Agent Grafton enters the office. Yes? Yes, all right, and thanks a lot, Inspector. We'll have an agent over there right away. Uh, Grafton. What's up? That was Inspector Riley of the Homicide Squad. Oh? An ex-serviceman was shot and seriously wounded a little while ago in his village apartment. I see. We don't know whether it has any connection with the shooting, but uh, a fake passport made out for his wife was found in the man's pocket. Uh-oh. The police are taking him now to St. Anthony's Hospital. By the time you get there, he may have regained consciousness. Well, I'm on my way. Uh, ask the police to let you have that fake passport. It might be our best lead to date in case the chap doesn't recover. And get back as soon as you can, will you? Right. Yeah? Who is it? Me, George. Oh. Get your stuff together quick, baby. We got a scram. Why? What's all the excitement? I had to let the sucker have it. You did what? Somebody put him wise. He was waiting for me with both fists. George, you mean you... You think I'm going to stand there and let him work on me? You stupid fool, you... Look, baby, don't stand here gabbing. I killed the guy, don't you understand? Well, if you're sure you killed him, that's not so bad. What do you mean? Well, I'll have a tough time tying it in with you. George, you had sense enough to bring it back with you, didn't you? What? Don't. Oh. Tell me you left that fake passport down there. Yeah, yeah, I did. Oh, brother! Oh, stop your beefing, will you? We gotta get out of here. Not me. Huh? We're a lot better off staying right here. Why do you figure that? 
Well, if somebody put them wise to us, they can also put the cops wise to what we look like. Okay, but we... will be watching every train, bus, and airline for us. All right, you stay here, baby, but I'm getting out. Wait a minute! If they catch you, I fall too. Yeah, but we... No dice, George. You're sticking right here with me. You understand? Okay. Now, sit down, genius. Give me the whole story. Well, I talked to the victim, Mr. Everett. Good. What'd you get, Grafton? The swindler we've been looking for shot him. But he was apparently in such a hurry to get away, he left the fake passport behind. Was he able to give more than a description of the swindler? Only that he's known as George, and the girl is Betty, that's all. I see. The fingerprints of both of them are probably on this fake passport. We'll put it through for a check right away. And we ought to have another lead in the kind of paper they used in making them up. Right. Shall I take a sample of it and start checking stationers to see who handles it and who's been buying it? Yes, you start the ball rolling on that while I cover on all train, bus, and air terminals. Right. And then we'll... Hey, wait a minute. Yeah? Well, we'll watch the travel terminals anyway. They're probably taking the smarter course of staying under right here. In that case, it's up to us to smoke them out. And I think I've got an idea that'll do just that. Huh? Oh, I'm getting. There's not a thing in the morning paper about your little stunt last night. You ought to hire a press agent. Never mind the wisecracks, will you? Oh, for heaven's sake, relax. You've been jumping up and down like a sewing machine all morning. I've got a right to be jumpy, haven't I? You don't hear my knees knocking, do you? I don't like it. There not being anything in the paper about it. I told you to get a press agent. I don't mean that. Well, what do you mean? Look... Sometimes cops keep things like this out of the paper on purpose. Like what purpose? Like when they suspect somebody of doing the job and don't want the papers to tell them so and make them harder to catch. Will you stop feeling the police breathing on your neck? Look, lay off, will you? I'm sick Wait a minute, wait a minute. What is it? Well, genius, you can relax. Well, what'd you find? The newspaper didn't ignore your little party last night after all. Well, what's it say? The sucker's not dead. What? Then what do you mean, relax? He's in the hospital. We'll recover, and all he will say for publication at this time is that the shooting was all a mistake. And he refuses to identify the person who did it. No kidding. Well, what do you know? I think you ought to send him some flowers, George. I think we ought to get out of here now. Let's head for the coast like I said. Wait. What? How would you like for us to make maybe a lot of money all at once first? How do you mean? Selling another passport? Oh, are you crazy? We're both crazy if we don't make this thing. Who to? According to the paper here, the rich and social Richard Adams, ex-GI, is having all manner of trouble getting his blooming British broad over here, don't you know? Yeah? Yeah. And he's crying about it. From the plush depths of his penthouse apartment. And here's the address. Hey. I'll make up a book for him right away. You trade it to Mr. Adams for 5000 and we'll be off for Frisco. Well, here's the report on that fingerprint check, Mr. Everett. Identify them? Yes, sir. The man is George Canton, alias George Patterson. And the girl? His accomplice, Betty Douglas, former nightclub entertainer. Both have swindling records. Good enough. And we've located the stationer who sells the paper used in the fake passports. Oh? He identifies George Canton as one of his customers, but has no address for Canton. Well, we won't worry too much about that right now. I have a plan in mind that should solve all our worries. Well, it's about time you showed. California, here we come. 
You did okay? Oh, that guy Adams was like shooting lions in the zoo, baby. How much? Five Gs, just like you said. Where is it? Right here. Give it to Mama. Huh? You heard me. I said give it to Mama. But, sweetheart, I can... First, I want to see if it's all here. What's the matter? Do you think I can add? Yeah. I think you can subtract, too. Don't trust me, huh? The last guy I trusted was the last guy. Hey, well, what's the idea? Why haven't you got your stuff packed yet? Oh, it'll only take a minute. I guess you didn't have much faith in my salesmanship, huh, baby? Not after your performance last night. All right, all right. Lay off that now, will you? It's all turned out sweet, hasn't it? Uh, I'm going to keep my fingers crossed anyway until we're on the... Uh-oh. Keep quiet. It's too late for that. Whoever it is must have heard us talking. Okay. You go to the door and throw it open. I'll be ready with a blast. You think... Go on. Do what I tell you. Hello there. Well, Mr. Adams. That's right. And your butler, too. <laughs> What's the idea? If you had brought the young lady with you, we wouldn't have had to follow you here. What do you mean? I mean, miss, that we're really special agents of the FBI. What? I'll take that gun. Oh, oh, George! 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 <laughs> your victim down at the hospital is ready to <laughs> identify you for publication now. Come on. For forging and counterfeiting a government document, the passport swindlers are now serving full term in a federal penitentiary. After he has paid his debt to the United States government, the man called George must still stand trial on a charge of assault with intent to commit murder in New York State. And once again, your FBI joins with your local law enforcement officers in urging you, the potential victims of swindlers, to be wary of the stranger with a proposition. If the proposition is sound, it will keep long enough for you to investigate it and the person who offers it. If it is unsound, your investigation will prove it to be so. That is your duty to yourself and to society. Next week, another exciting adventure story from the files of your FBI. We'll tell you about it in just a moment. As you listen to tonight's radio program, you must have realized why you look to your FBI for national security. Trained men such as these FBI agents are the best safeguard you can have. And you can depend upon the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States for the financial security of life insurance for the same reasons. Able, trained men and women, experts in preserving homes, in keeping children in school, making old age comfortable. The Equitable Society representative in your community, the name Equitable Society is in your telephone book, is skilled in all phases of life insurance security and experienced in its application to your particular problems. He, yes, and she, specialize in building security for you, your home, and your country. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Delinquent Parents. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was under the direction of Frederick Steiner, the author was Frank Ferries, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production.
This is Carl Frank speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Delinquent Parents on This Is Your FBI. ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. We exceedingly regret that due to unforeseen circumstances, Mr. Thomas I. Parkinson, president of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, will not be able to address you on the subject of inflation on tonight's program has been announced. Mr. Parkinson will, however, speak on this subject over this same network at a later date. If you've been listening regularly to these FBI programs, such as tonight's case, which will open in just a moment, you have heard the word cooperation used a great many times. And that's because it's a key word in the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Eighty-six years ago, a group of self-reliant men and women cooperated to found the Equitable Society to assure each member more security than any individual effort could provide. And now, the sound common sense of such an enterprise is revealed once more in the yearly report of the Equitable Society to its members. Just published... This report is so interesting that later on I want to tell you about this book. A book which proves once again that by serving its members, the Equitable Society serves America. Tonight's FBI file, The Wasteland Hideout. Far more numerous than the so-called psychopathic killers and dangerous to more people are killers of the type dealt with in tonight's case from the files of your FBI. Professional criminals to whom murder is merely another tool of their trade, who kill without cause, real or imagined, solely as a means to an end. They are indeed the dealers of sudden death. In a small cabin somewhere deep inside the blackness of the Bitterroot timber country, separating Idaho and Montana, a man sits before a rough table in the yellow glow of a lantern, clenching his left arm from which blood oozes. Eddie. Eddie. Yes? Hurry up with that pan of water, will you? Uh, right with you. I wish you'd let me heat this stuff first, Rocky. I don't want no fires. Well, it's night outside. Who's going to see? Look. You can see smoke against the sky at night. I don't want no forest ranger getting hep that anyone's here. Oh. Now clean off his arm and get some bandage on it. Uh, are you sure the slug ain't still in there? I told you it went clean through. Oh. Well, just hold still then. <clears throat> yeah, how long you had this hideout? I picked it up five years ago. Yeah, it sure is buried away. That's why I nailed it. 
Any hunting around here? Sure. How about fishing? Plenty. Hey, this is going to be a regular vacation, huh? Not exactly. We just go under here until the heat cools off. <laughs> Easy, will you? Oh, sorry. Uh, Eddie. Yeah? There's a job you're going to have to do. Uh, what's that? you got to rustle us some grub. You mean go hunting? Nah, stupid. you got to get some store grub. Hey, but you said there was plenty of hunting. There's plenty of guys hunting for us. We ain't running loose in these woods. Oh. Uh, where's the store? There's a joint about ten miles from here. Yeah. You got any dough? You don't use dough. You heist it. Oh. If I could make it, I'd go myself. But I can't, so I gotta send you. And look, just for once, do a job right, will you? Oh, now, Rocky, you know I... I know if it hadn't been for you, I wouldn't have this bum wing. Now, listen close. I'm gonna tell you how to get there, and you're gonna get it right if I have to spell every word. <laughs> Pop Culwell's combination filling station and grocery store on the highway through the Bitterroot country is not too heavily patronized, but enough to keep him going. And the radio on the counter is enough to keep him company. Pop is sitting on a box in his store reading a paper and listening to a musical program out of Spokane. Then suddenly... We interrupt this program of music, ladies and gentlemen, to bring you a special police bulletin. Well, what's that? All motorists and persons living on highways in the area comprising southeast Washington, northern Idaho, and southwest Montana are warned to be on the alert for two men who escaped from the federal penitentiary this afternoon after killing a guard. Well, what do you If you know? should see them, go to the nearest phone and call the police or the FBI. Under no circumstances, engage them in conversation. They will kill without provocation. Here are their descriptions. Edward Corning, age 35. Five feet Turn it off, mister. Huh? Turn it off. Weighs 100... Where'd you come from? I just walked in. You're... You're one of them fellas That's that just... That's right. What you want here? Groceries, a big stack of them. And I need a car, too. Well, you ain't getting neither one. Oh, no, you don't. <coughs> Jerk. Hey, Pop! Pop! Pop, I gotta get my girl home and... Hey, mister, where's Pop? Maybe I can take care of what you want. I gotta talk to Pop. I gotta get some gas on the cuff. Where is he? Don't come back here. Oh, it's okay. I always... Oh, gee. I told you not to come back here. What happened to him? He had an accident. Why, his head's bleeding. Leave him alone. You did this to him. Dick, are you going to take... Don't come in here, Midge. What's wrong, Dick? Stay back. Don't come in. <gasps> come on, Midge. L let's get back in the car. Wait a minute. You're going to stay here and give me a hand. Now, look, this Mr. gun's given the orders. Oh. You're going to help me load some groceries. Then we'll all get in the car. How are you feeling now, Mr. Caldwell? Well, I'm coming around all right, I reckon. Who are you, fellas? My name's Perry. This is Mr. Norton. We're special agents of the FBI. How do you do, sir? How do you do? Well, now, that beats all. How do you know I was in trouble? We didn't, Mr. Caldwell. Hmm? We're on the trail of two men who escaped from the federal penitentiary. Yeah, I know. I heard it on the radio. It was one of them that walloped me. Yes, we had an idea it was something like that. When did it happen? Well, it was... Right after 8 o'clock. That was only 30 minutes ago, Jim. Yeah. We can't be very far behind them now, especially since they're on foot. On foot? We found the car they stole down the road, abandoned, burned out bearing. What'd they come here for, Mr. Caldwell? Well, there's only the one came in. He wanted some groceries. Groceries? Yeah. Oh, then they must have a hideout somewhere up. Wait a minute. What is it, Jim? It's a girl's compact here on the floor. Well, no. Where'd that come from? 
The initials are M-E-L. You know who that might be, sir? M-E-L. Oh, sure, that, that can't be nobody else but young Midge Ellen Lancaster lives back in Summit. I see. And if she was here, then Dick Barstow, who's sweet on her, was here with her for sure. Does he have a car? Yeah, he practically lives in one. And that accounts for the fresh car tracks outside by the gas pumps, Jim. Mm, probably means more than that, too. Uh, do the parents of these youngsters have phones, Mr. Caldwell? Yes, they do. All right, we'll call them, George. Right. And if neither of those kids is at home, the bandits have them in their car, too. No telling where they are by now. Let's get on that phone quick. <laughs> Got slow going back. We don't want to miss that turn off trail into the woods again, you hear? I hear you. Oh, Dick. If we'd only started for home before dark, like I promised Mother, this wouldn't have happened to us. I know. It's, it's all my fault. Oh, I didn't mean it that way. Yeah, but it's true. Hey, look, pay attention to your driving, will you? Dick, Mother and Daddy will be out of their minds. Oh, don't worry about them. They're okay. It's us I'm thinking about. Especially you. Oh, Dick. What'll we do? I know what we'll do. Hey, what are you stopping for? Look, mister, I don't know what you're planning to do with us, but whatever it is, I'm not letting my girl in for it. You better start the car going again. I'm not driving another foot. I'm not taking... Uh, uh, oh. Dick. Shut up, both of you. Now, let's move. And like I said, go slow so we don't miss the turn-off trail to the woods again. Yes, sir. And try not to worry. I'm confident everything will turn out all right. Yes, we'll keep in touch with you. Goodbye, sir. Well, I guess that cinches it, Jim. Both kids are missing. Mm. While you're at the phone, George, you better get out an alarm on the car and the boy and girl. Oh, right, sure. Oh. Hello, operator. Oh, get me the FBI office in Spokane right away, please. Yeah, that's right. I'll hold on. Say, George. Yeah? Those car tracks outside turn around going out of the drive and head east. Now, if they kept driving steadily after leaving here, they couldn't have made more than 50 or 60 miles. What are you thinking? Let's get the office to contact police at all points 100 miles east of here. That'll block all roads ahead of them. Right. Then if we don't get a report back here in a reasonable length of time, we'll know that they've holed up somewhere in this area. Well, let's hope they keep driving through. Well, if they take to the tall timber, that'll be rugged hunting. Yeah, I, wait. I think I've got the office. Hello? Hello? This is George Norton. Get out an alarm right away on this car. Black Ford Sedan. <laughs> Okay, stop here. Get out, both of you. Come on, Midge. We have to do what he says. Dick, I, I'm scared. Just, just hold my hand. Walk ahead of me. Head for the cabin. Come on, get moving. Dick. What are we going to do? We'll get out of this some way. Don't worry. I hope you're right. Yeah, this is it. All right, inside you, kids. Eddie, what is this? Oh, hi, Rocky. <laughs> Did you think I was never coming back? Who are these kids? They brung me here. What? I used their car. Oh, you stupid. I had to, Rocky. Why? Well, they come in the store right after I slugged them. Slugged who? The grocery guy. Oh. Well, you sent me for groceries, didn't you? Look, mister. Shut up. I won't shut up. We want to go home. Eddie, this puts us in a real jam. Well, I couldn't help it, Rocky. Anybody see you take those kids? Anybody tell you? No. Are you sure? Yeah, there wasn't anybody in the joint but the grocery guy. Look, what else could I do? You could drop dead. And sister, cut out the crying. 
Not till you let us out of here. That ain't gonna happen, sweetheart. What do you mean by that? You're staying here, Junior. No, no. Shut up. <laughs> Why, you dirty... Easy, Junior. Oh, no, I'm oh, gonna... Hey. Hey, let's eat something, Rocky. I'm hungry. In a moment, we'll reopen tonight's FBI file. Meanwhile, let's open another important record. This week at the Equitable Society, the advertising manager handed me an attractive little book. Here, he said, you might like to look this over. It's our annual report for 1945. Well, I expected to see the usual columns of dry figures. But this Equitable Society report was something else again. It was a 24-page book, bright with color, sparkling with interesting facts. Its title is Your Policy. And as, as I read it, I thought, Here's one of the most forceful tributes to cooperation I've ever seen. It just shows what people can accomplish when they honestly and willingly work together for protection and security. Of course, this book, Your Policy, will be mailed automatically to members of the Equitable Society. But let me give all of you listening tonight some of its highlights. This book explains how the Equitable Society's investments aid government, industry, agriculture, homeowners. In short, how the society, by serving its members, serves America. The book tells about the $238 million that the Equitable Society paid out in 1945, paid to widows and children, paid on endowments, paid in annuities, paid in dividends to millions of members. It tells what every war veteran should do to keep his National Service life insurance in force. And it tells you how your Equitable Society representative is trained to serve you in many, many ways. This isn't all it tells, but it's enough to prove to anyone that this week and every week for more than 86 years, the Equitable Life Assurance Society has been building security for you your home, and your country. And now back to the FBI file, The Wasteland Hideout. When fugitive criminals keep on the move, they're in the open and their capture is largely just a matter of keeping on their trail until they can be overtaken. But when they go underground, when they hole up in some unknown hideout, the job of capture is not so simple. And if, as in tonight's case, the unknown hideout be somewhere inside several million acres of mountains and timber, the job may present a staggering handicap. Some two hours have now passed since the man called Rocky struck down the boy, Dick Barstow, in the hideout deep inside the Bitterroot Timber Country. Back at Pop Caldwell's filling station and grocery store on the highway, actually only ten miles as the crow flies from the hideout, Special Agents Perry and Norton of the FBI are studying a map and hoping the phone will ring. They couldn't possibly have had more than a 50 or 60 mile start from here when you put out the alarm, George. Yeah, I know. We've got police and deputies covering all roads east of here. I don't see how they could have gotten through. Still, the phone doesn't ring with any report. Mm. Then that's got to mean only one thing. They've stopped traveling. Here's some hot coffee for you, boys. Oh, thank oh, you, thank Mr. Caldwell. Take milk and sugar in it? No, not for me. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Say, Jim, hmm? if they've taken to the tall timber, what do we do now? Well, I'm afraid there's not a great deal we can do tonight. We stand a much better chance in daylight of finding some trace of where they might have turned off. And let's be up at the crack of dawn and get at it. Right. You know something, boys? What's that? It'd be mighty funny if them convicts wasn't much more than spitting distance from here. Oh, oh. oh. 
Dick. Dick. Oh, I... Uh, I oh, thank heaven. Oh, oh, my head. Lie still, Dick. Don't try to move. Mitch, what are you doing here? I mean that... Oh. Please, Dick, uh, just lie still. Where are we? What happened? Don't you remember? Remember? Remember what? Never mind. Don't try to think. I'm just so happy that you're alive. I... I thought that horrible man had killed you. Killed me? What are you talking... Hey, wait a minute. I remember now. He slapped me and... And you started to fight him. And he slugged me? Yes. How long have I been out? All night. What? Look outside. It's daylight. Are we, are we still in the cabin? Yes. Where are those men? They went outside a few minutes ago. Hey, then... Then maybe we can get out of here. No, please. They're just down by the car. I can see them through the window. Oh. Dick. Yeah? I don't think we're ever going to get out. What do you mean? I heard them talk. They're escaped convicts. They killed a guard and then got away. They're very desperate men. Pop probably got killed, too. Yes. Dick? Yeah? If that's how it's going to be, they may kill us, too. And, well, there's something I want you to know. Yeah? Remember the night at, at the school dance? You, you asked me something? Yeah. About, about us getting married someday? Uh-huh. I didn't know the answer then. But I do now. Thanks, Midge. <laughs> oh, Dick. <laughs> but don't, Midge. Don't cry, please. If we're going to have to die, then... Hey, wait a minute. Maybe we are going to have to die. What? L let me get up. What are you going to do? I've got an idea. If those men only stay out of here long enough, it might work. Well, George, we've cruised up and down this road for 20 miles and still no sign of where any car turned off up in the woods. Well, they must have covered up any signs like that. I'm afraid so. Hey, I've got an idea. Yeah? If they've got a hideout in the timber, it must be an old trapper cabin or a hut in an abandoned logging camp. Uh -huh. So we start looking for all the cabins scattered through several million acres of tall timber. No, no, we can make the job easier than that. How? There's a forest ranger lookout up in there, and he's probably got every cabin spotted on a map. Say, you're right. Let's go see him right now. You FBI fellas have picked out a pretty good job for yourselves, I'd say. How do you mean? Reducing the area where the killers are likely to be hiding, even to that smallest circle. Yeah? I'd say there are probably 30 or 40 cabins sprinkled around in that area. Well, uh, I, I realize it's a lot of legwork, but it's got to be done. And one of them might be the one we want. Okay. Here's your map with the cabin spotted on it. Good. And I'll get a guide for you, and that'll save Sorry. time and... Look. Where? On that ridge, right over there to the east. Mm -hmm. uh, it's smoke from a cabin. I saw it just before you fellas drove up. Yeah, but look at it now. What about it, George? Somebody's doing something with that smoke. What? Yeah. Looks like somebody was trying to signal with it. Yeah. Say, where is that on the map? I can locate it in a second on the fire finder here. Good. Jim, if that smoke is coming from a cabin in the circle we laid out, it'll be the first one we go to. And in a big hurry, too. Well, that's that. 
Why'd you drive the car way under them trees, Rocky? So nobody could spot it. Nobody could see it where it was. From the air they could. That car's red hot. They'll use planes or anything to find it. Oh. Hey, Rock. Yeah? Did you start a fire this morning? What are you talking about? Look. There's smoke coming out of the chimney in the cabin. What? Yeah, see it? Come on. Hey, what's the matter? The kid started that. Oh, I thought... Shut up and hurry. Put that fire out, kid. It's too late now, mister. Give me that bucket of water, Eddie. Right. Here you are. There. What'd you set a fire for, kid? I know what he set it for. How long you been at it, kid? Long enough, I hope. Well, we're not gonna stick around to find out. Are we leaving, Rocky? Yes, yeah, stupid. Uh, what are we gonna do with them? What you should have done at the old man's place when they came in, if you had any brains. Dick! Wait a minute, mister. You got no time to argue now, Junior. Look, kill me or do anything you want to, but let her go, please. Not a chance. Drop that gun, you. Rocky, look out. I'm not dropping any gun. Oh. Rocky! All right, keep this <laughs> other man covered, George. I'm sorry, young lady, that you had to see that. <laughs> Thank you, mister. We're special agents of the FBI. And I imagine uh, they were your smoke signals, huh, son? Yes, sir. Good work. And now we're going to take you both home to your folks. Come on. Rocky and his accomplice in crime were tried for the murder of the prison guard. They were both convicted for this crime and sentenced to death by hanging. And so ended the career of two more dealers of sudden death. There are, however, many more of their kind still at large. Unfortunately, neither your local law enforcement officers nor your FBI know just who and where they all are, nor when any will strike. But of this, you and they may rest assured. When one does strike, he'll be pursued day and night, 24 hours around the clock. And let him hide out wherever he chooses. He will be found. In next week's exciting program, which we'll tell you about in just a moment, this is your FBI, will present new evidence to prove how well the FBI guards national security. And in the booklet called Your Policy, the same one I was talking to you about a few minutes ago, the Equitable Society presents new evidence to prove how carefully and intelligently the society protects your financial security through life insurance. If you're not already a member of the Equitable Life Assurance Society, ask the Equitable Society representative in your community for a free copy of this booklet. It's so interesting, so easy to read. Get a copy from your Equitable Society representative, a neighbor whom you ought to know anyway, for like your FBI, he is constantly working for the protection of you, your home, and your country. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Bogus War Brides. We exceedingly regret that due to unforeseen circumstances, Mr. Thomas I. Parkinson, president of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, was not able to address you on the subject of inflation on tonight's program as had been announced. Mr. Parkinson will, however, speak on this subject over this same network at a later date. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was under the direction of Frederick Steiner, 
The author was Frank Ferries, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. Now, this is Carl Frank speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Bogus War Bride. On this is your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Since you've been listening to these programs, such as the one which will start in a moment, you doubtlessly have often heard someone say, I'm insured in the Equitable Society. But just what does that much-used word equitable mean? Well, in the big dictionary, its synonyms are reasonable, right, honest, impartial, upright, fair. Pretty good list of pretty good words, isn't it? And we of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States do our best to live up to them. It's because we've worked along these lines for 86 years that the Equitable Society is a part of the life of your community. And whether you know him or not, the Equitable Society representative in your community is a good friend of yours, working through life insurance for the security of you, your home, and your country. Tonight's FBI file, The Paroled Killer. There is not one of us, with his inborn American sense of fair play, who would deny the essential justice, in principle, of the parole system. The system under which certain categories of convicts may be conditionally freed from prison before the expiration of their full sentence. But the front pages of our newspapers almost daily bear violent witness to the fact, demonstrated in tonight's case from the files of your FBI, that some convicts are paroled whom, for the sake of society, it would be far wiser to leave behind the bars. Convict number 728056 of a certain state prison has just been ushered into the office of the warden. He is a rather tall, lean, blonde young man with smooth, sensitive features. His artistic hands grow restless as he waits for the warden to look up from a sheaf of papers on his desk. Presently, the warden speaks. Oh, warden? Yes, sir? Uh, I guess you're anxious to know the outcome of your appearance before the parole board yesterday. Uh, yes, sir. As you might well imagine, I spent most of the night wondering. Did you ever hear of the Second Chance Society? I think I have, sir. It's a very worthwhile organization and with a noble purpose. But I sometimes wish they were better informed on criminology before they exerted pressure on parole boards. Well, what do you mean, sir? The board was inclined to deny you parole, Norwood. Oh. But a representative of the Second Chance Society interceded in your behalf. Your parole has been granted. That's fine, sir. Norwood, I oppose your parole. Why? My prison record is without a blemish. That's right. But you didn't become a criminal by chance, or because of environment or association with evil companions. A man of your intellect can pretty much choose his own way of life. And can make mistakes, too, Warden. Well, I earnestly hope you've resolved to go straight. All your instructions uh, for reporting to your parole officer, you'll find in this envelope with your other papers. Thank you, sir. 
You have my sincerest and best wishes. It's all up to you, Norwood. This is your second chance. Now make the most of it. You can rest assured, sir, that I shall. Carl. Mm. Carl. Uh, uh, Wake up. What? Wake up, I said. Oh, leave me alone. I'm tired. Carl, I want to talk to you. Look, if this is about where I was last night, I had to work, so leave me alone. I don't want no rhubarbs. I don't want to argue, darling. Oh, that's a switch. I have a surprise for you. Hmm? Guess who's out of stripes as of yesterday? Out of jug? Yeah. Who? What are you talking about? Hmm. Sweating already. Answer me, will you? Who's out? Ray Norwood. Ray? I thought he had six more months to go. He was paroled. Look, is this a rib or something? No. How do you know he's out? He called about a half hour ago. He's on his way over here. He's what? You want to borrow my hanky, darling? Your lovely low-cut brow is covered with itsy-bitsy beads of perspiration. Shut up, will you? It's understandable, of course. You got a perfect right to be scared. After all, it was your testimony that hung the rap on him. Shut up, I said. What are your plans, darling? Let me think. Now, what are your plans? Don't answer the door. But I told him we'd be here. Tell him. Tell him I ain't home. That'd be childish. Wait a minute. Come back here. Oh, no. Jane. Hello, darling. Hello, Ray. Come on in, won't you? Thank you, sweet. Well, it certainly seems like... Here we like... are, Ray. What? That's what I said. Well, I must say that's hardly a way to greet an old friend. Call oh, put down that gun. Oh, no. Well, I think Jean's made an excellent suggestion. Why the gun? What do you think? Oh, my dear boy, you have nothing to fear from me. Absolutely nothing. Are you kidding? Why, of course not. You evidently imagine that I've come here seeking revenge for your testimony at my trial. That's right. No. I hold no grudge for that. From your standpoint, it was simply a matter of self-preservation. Huh? Well, one of the reasons I came here was to convince you of that. Oh, now, no, please, put down that gun. Do as he says, Carl. Oh, uh, okay. That's better. And now you might be interested to know that I've been given a second chance. The warden asked me to make the most of it. So... Uh, to please him. Let's get busy. Yes, sir? What can I do for you? It's all written down on this piece of paper, Mr. Teller. There you are. Oh, let me see. You want stacks of 20s and stacks of 10s? Right. Fifteen grand words. You can put it in this bag. Yeah. <laughs> but your check, sir. Your check to cover. This gun looking at you should be cover enough. What? And if you make one move to step on that alarm pedal, you won't be going home to your wife tonight. Put the bad stuff in a bag like I told you. Well, you, you won't get away with this. It better not be your fault, Glenn. Okay. That's a twenties, not a tens. And get this, too. I'm going to walk out of here normal-like, which means my back will be to you. But that girl standing over there is a better shot than Annie Oakley. So, hold this pose until we're both gone. Okay? about two hours later when Special Agents Griffin and Decatur completed their preliminary investigation of the scene of the bank robbery and started driving back to headquarters. Did you get any leads at all, Fred? Nobody I talked to saw anything. What about the bank's special officer on duty? Well, he was at the side door when it happened, overseeing oh. the transfer of some money from a Norman car. Looks like they picked their time rather cleverly. Yes. Well, what about the teller? Well, he gave a pretty sketchy description of the man. Too excited, I guess, for all the details to register. Could he give you anything on the girl? No. Just said she was an attractive blonde. Hmm. 
Well, it seems like they just walked in, picked up 15,000, walked calmly out, and disappeared without leaving a trace. No, they left a trace, all right. What? Oh, I've got the note that the bandit handed the teller through the window. Oh? Not much, but he might have left a fingerprint on it. We'll know when we get to the laboratory. Oh, we're pushing time on this one. Let's step on it. Just a minute. Hello, darling. Hello, Ray. Come on in. Thank you. Where's Carl? Out. I don't know where. Good. I want to talk to you. What about? You and Carl. Well? How has he been treating you? <laughs> Let's talk about something pleasant. He'd be back here before I could finish telling you what a dirty, lying, double-crossing, cheating, two-timing... No, that's quite convincing. That's just how I feel about it myself. Hmm? Well, well how come the forgive and forget act the other night? It netted us $15,000, didn't it? You and me? What are you getting at, this? You and me. A two-way division of the spoils, darling. Say, you know, I'd like to kiss that parole board for giving you a pass home. Then it's a bargain. Now we're going to cut Carl out and make it stick. I planned the bank job, didn't I? Yeah. Providing a way to cut Carl out was part of the plan. I don't get you. <laughs> Let's wait for Carl. <laughs> Jane? Jane? I'm right here, Carl. Oh, we're both here. Good. Well, how about getting down to business now? What business? Splitting the dough. Oh, uh, I'm afraid I have a bit of bad news for you concerning that, Carl. What do you mean? I'm afraid something happened this afternoon that'll deprive you of any part of the money. Are you kidding? No. What's this plush mouth talking about, Jane? Just listen, darling. You have a police record complete with fingerprints, you know, Carl. So what? The note you handed the bank teller was written on a piece of paper which you handled several times. Your prints are on it. What? So you see, the police will be looking for you now. Why, you double I'm crook. just evening our score, Carl. That's fair, isn't it? You don't think you're going to get away with it? Why not? Well... Well, you, you were part of the act, too, you know. I wasn't in the bank. Yeah, but you were parked a block down the street and drove Gene and me away. The police can't prove that. They'll prove plenty when I tell them where to go to look for the money. Are you... You'll tell them? Sure. About Gene, too? Why not? Look, if I take a rap, you're all going to take a rap. I'll yell my head off before I let you get away. Ah! And that, darling, is my good deed for the day. Before resuming tonight's FBI file, as we shall in just a moment, let me describe another little drama for you. A drama that, while it might be less exciting, nevertheless has a mighty important application to you and your loved ones. This week at the Equitable Society, I happened to walk into the building carrying a heavy suitcase. And suddenly the suitcase seemed to grow lighter in my hand, and a voice said, Here, let me help carry that with you. Well, it was a friend of mine in the company. An Equitable Society representative who'd taken hold of the handle. Thanks a lot, I said. It's a pretty heavy load. So I noticed, he answered. That's why I'm helping you out. That's my business. And you know, he was 100% right when he said that. For it is the business of life insurance agents to help people. Help them carry financial burdens and responsibilities. Responsibilities like education for children, security for old age, the problem of keeping a home together. And that's just what the Equitable Society representative in your town stands ready to do for you. He's a man you can go and talk to any time. He's trained in all the uses of life insurance. And you'll find he gets a real satisfaction in helping you use life insurance to make your burdens lighter. Don't be backward about piling your troubles on him. His shoulders are broad. 
and the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States is strong. Yes, this week and every week for 86 years, the Equitable Society has been building security for you, your home, and your country. And now, back to the FBI file, The Paroled Killer. In most cases, the parole boards throughout America are composed of conscientious and qualified men and women who perform well the difficult job of deciding whether a convict eligible for parole can safely be returned to society. But far too often, they yield to the pressure of well-meaning but uninformed persons and are forced to parole convicts who are loosed upon society with tragic and criminal results. As witness... 48 hours after convict Raymond Norwood was paroled, he had engineered a $15,000 bank robbery, murdered a man, and was still at large. It is some 30 minutes now after Carl Sterling crumpled to the floor with two pistol slugs in his body. Special FBI agents Griffin and Decatur arrive at the apartment. Better stand to one side, Fred. Just in case Sterling resents our visit. I can't imagine him being dumb enough to sit here and wait to be picked up. Well, he was dumb enough to leave his calling card at the bank, wasn't he? Yeah, but... Hey, wait a minute. What's the matter? We'd better get the manager to let us in. Why? Look at what's oozing through the crack under the door. Uh-uh. We don't need a key. The door's open. Come on. Watch it. Looks like one of them got the worst of an argument. It's Sterling. Oh. Is he dead, John? Yeah. Well, it's all pretty fresh. We couldn't have missed it by very much. What's in there, Fred? Oh, bedroom. A lot of pull-out drawers. Mm -hmm. It's her stuff that seems to be missing. Sure. It would be now. He doesn't seem to have started any packing at all. Everything of his is in place. Well, then that's the answer. She wanted to be a widow and with $15,000 initial capital. Yeah, it looks that way. We'd better get a wanted notice out on her. See if we can get a line on what kind of car they own, too. Oh, that shouldn't be difficult to arrive at. Wait a minute, hold it. What is it? It's a little pocketbook automatic. Oh, her gun. Could be. Two shots fired. And that's the number of holes in Sterling, too. But what's the idea of leaving her gun behind? That's pretty stupid. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Maybe it's too stupid. Huh? Maybe, to coin an old phrase, there's a little more here than meets the eye. Ray? Yes, darling? I'm not exactly the 90-mile-an-hour type, but considering our Class B movie exit tonight... Uh... Don't you think we ought to be driving a little uh, faster? And have a state trooper arrest us for speeding? Car's probably hot for now, anyway. Well, that's true. So what are we going to do? Keep on modeling it? No, my pet. I have a much more practical idea. Like what? Like this. Ray! Ray, are you crazy? Why? You almost plunged us down that ravine. But I didn't. Thanks to the good brakes. But... How come you're parking here? Well, I told you. I have a more practical idea. Uh, for me, anyway. What do you mean? Those skid marks across the road will look like you swerved over toward the ravine to avoid a crash. Right? I swerved? Oh, but, uh, but you're driving. But when they find the car piled up at the bottom of the ravine, I won't be in it. What are you saying? I'm saying au revoir, my sweet <laughs> And so the villain took the $15,000 and pushed the girl and the car over the cliff. Well, 
Fred, what's the lab say? The slugs taken from Sterling were fired from that gun you picked up. Oh, that figured. You're still convinced it was the work of a third person, huh? Yes. Revenge work, too. Sterling's leaving his prints on that note of the bank wasn't a dumb move on his part. It was meant to be a smart move on the part of somebody else. To pin the job on him. That's right. Couldn't that have been his wife? No, no. She would hardly have been that clever and then left her pistol behind as obvious evidence. Oh, and that's where the third person comes in. Yes. Somebody who had good reason in his own mind to frame Sterling with a bank job and frame the girl with murder. Who would that be? Well, I've been looking over the police information on their background. Yeah? Sterling and his wife at one time were more or less stooges for a man named Raymond Norwood. Oh. Norwood was sent up a year and a half ago on a robbery charge. But where's the revenge motive? Well, Sterling turned state's witness against Norwood. But how could Norwood get revenge if he's still in prison? Oh, he was paroled two days ago. Well, then what are we waiting for? Let's find him. Well, we've got to get some tangible evidence on him first. Like what? Well, if we can prove the presence of a third party in all this, the bank job, the murder, and the girl's getaway, I'll take it. Special Agent Griffin speaking. Who? Oh? oh, yes. State trooper. Oh, yeah? Yes. Oh? Uh, yes, I see. What's that location again, please? Yes. Yes, yes, good. Hold everything. We'll be out there right away. What's up? State Highway Patrol has just found Sterling's car piled up in the bottom of a ravine. Well. well I'm afraid the third person theory is shot to pieces. Now, how's that? A girl's body is the only one in the car. Oh, so she was getting away on her own. Yes. Well, let's get out there fast. <laughs> I agree with you, Fred. Those skid marks back up on the highway make it look like an accident, but then again, maybe it wasn't. <laughs> Sticking to the third party idea, huh? Well, where do we take a look at the wreck? Oh, that looks like the heap over there by that state trooper. Yeah. Oh, officer, do you mind if we have a look? We're special agents of the FBI. Oh, go right ahead. Thanks. Fred, throw your light over this way, will you? Oh, what a mess. Yeah. Oh, look. Look, there's a traveling bag. Come here. No. Lift up the side a little while I pull it out, will you? Okay. All right, now. Oh, okay, I got it. That does it. All right, shine your light down here, will you? What's in there? Just clothes. Yeah, that's all. No $15,000. But that still doesn't... I know, I I know. The third party. Well, let's look around a little more. Fred! Yeah. Come here. What did you find? The evidence I've been looking for. What? Where? This is the right front door of the car, isn't it? Uh, that's right. Well, the girl sitting next to it, she couldn't very well have been driving the car, could she? Uh, no. Come on. Next stop, Norwood. Yeah, but where? I think I've got a good idea about that, too. Can I help you, sir? Yes, I'm Raymond Norwood. I'm making my initial appearance before the parole officer. Norwood, did you say? Yeah, that's right. I hope I shan't have to wait long. You won't. Just a minute, Mr. Norwood. Mr. Norwood is here now. Can you send him in, please? Come this way, please. Thank you. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. I presume you would like first to see my credentials. On the contrary, Norwood. Allow us to present our credentials. <laughs> well, what's this? We're special agents of the FBI. But I, I understood this was the office of the parole officer. That's why we're here. We knew you had to report here, Norwood, and we wanted to talk to you. What about? About the robbery of the City National Bank yesterday, the revenge murder of your former associate, Carl Sterling, the accidental death of Mrs. Sterling, which, of course, wasn't accidental at all. But you have no evidence that I had a hand in any of it? Norwood, if you had wanted it to appear that Mrs. Sterling was alone in the car... You should have seen to it that her dress wasn't caught in the door on the right side. Very clever, gentlemen. But I'm afraid I shall have to frustrate your plans for taking me... Oh, no, you don't... What? Now, what were you saying about frustrating someone? I... I suppose a retraction is in order. Come on, get up. And this time, Norwood, there'll be no parole.
Raymond Norwood was tried for his murder of his two accomplices, was convicted and returned again to prison. This time, he was executed for his crimes. Now, we would like you to listen to a statement prepared especially for tonight's program by J. Edgar Hoover, director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation on the subject of parole. Parole is a humanitarian and worthwhile institution designed to aid the wrongdoer who has learned the error of his ways by giving him another chance under supervision. Like all laws, its first objective must be the protection of society. Parole fails unless society benefits. The convenience of the wrongdoer must be subordinate to the safety of society. In far too many instances, parole is unworthy of its name. It is a liability rather than an asset to society when improperly administered. The fact that there are failures in parole, nevertheless, does not mean that the institution of parole is not worthwhile. It has not been adequately tried, except in few instances, notably under the federal parole system and a few states. Those experiments are notable examples of how parole should be applied. Not a day passes that does not find local, county, and state law enforcement officers and special agents of the FBI risking their lives to apprehend some criminal who has been freed by ill-advised parole. It is time that law-abiding citizens demanded and made provisions for adequate parole systems in their respective states. In just a moment, we'll tell you about next week's thrilling case from the files of the FBI. It will once again demonstrate the accuracy, the speed, and above all, the intelligence with which FBI men work. But now, let me introduce to you another expert in security, the Equitable Society representative in your community. You'll find him just as accurate, just as swift and intelligent in solving the problems of life insurance, solutions that mean homes kept together children educated, and old age made comfortable. In your community, the representative of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States is a man worth knowing, a man who likes his job, a man who is making a great contribution to building security for you, your home, and your country. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the Wasteland Hideout. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The role of J. Edgar Hoover was impersonated. However, all other names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was under the direction of Frederick Steiner, the author was Frank Ferries, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. Now, this is Carl Frank speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Wasteland Hideout. On this is your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.